Well, sometimes you practice something your whole life and you know something completely by heart until one day you are lost in what was always familiar. You may be a cradle Presbyterian at church since birth, and you're in the middle of reciting the Lord's Prayer, and suddenly it's like a foreign territory and you can't get a grip on where you are or what word is supposed to come next. Or you're the greatest gymnast of all time, performing a skill you've done thousands of times when suddenly you're not sure which way is up, which way is down, or how to land on your feet again. As many of us have recently learned from watching the Olympics, this lost in the air phenomenon is what gymnasts call the twisties. And as Simone Biles famously struggled during the recent Tokyo Olympics. Now, Simone Biles, Olympic struggles have been widely chronicled and her decisions not to compete have been analyzed and critiqued and celebrated and praised and there is much to say about that, about boundaries, mental health and the rest. But what interests me about it today is what her difficulties reveal. That even when you know something so well, sometimes you have to start all over again. For four days after the onset of Bile's case of the twisties on vault and her subsequent withdrawal from competition, she went to a daily, she went daily to a training gym out of the public eye and practiced over and over on skills she'd always known. And after years of being nearly flawless, she found herself having to let go of some of the more complex aspects of her routines and revisit old basics. When she made her comeback to the balance beam competition at the end of the Olympics, she had to swap her twisting dismount for a non-twisting one, which meant rehearsing hours on a skill that was so simple she apparently hadn't used it since she was 12. Now, I say simple, but of course we know that no one sitting here would ever have the guts to try any of that, so it's quite amazing. But in that back to basics routine, she seemed to find joy again. The whole world saw the relief and joy on her face again when she landed that dismount and experienced a taste of enjoying her sport again. So like a return to the basics of gymnastic skills, Psalm 111 at first appears to be like a return to elementary praise and theology. Give thanks to the Lord. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All of these phrases are found elsewhere in the Hebrew scriptures in addition to this psalm. And it makes this psalm read at times almost like a tour of common biblical phrases of praise. The psalm is essentially a litany of God's great qualities with an emphasis on God's works and God's teaching. And at times when we read it, we might feel it borders on so generic as to be meaningless. We can almost doze off as we hear the words. Great are the works of the Lord. God has gained renown by wonderful work. The works of his hands are faithful and just. Holy and awesome is his name. It can feel to some of us pretty basic. Yes, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food, like a prayer we all learned when we were three years old. Maybe that's true, and maybe sometimes we need to go back to basics. We don't know exactly the scenario in which this psalm was written, why the writer or the community that created this psalm needed a rediscovery of God's goodness or needed reminders of the basics of prayer and praise, but we do know that Psalm 111 came during the post-exilic period, after the exile, meaning that it came late in the Hebrew people's history after they had been exiled in Babylon and returned to Israel once again. 
This was a period, certainly, of disorientation and reorientation. They'd been disrupted, dispossessed, dragged through a difficult time that we could say flipped them on their heads in a kind of spiritual twisties. It was a period that for any nation, any other nation, as history shows, would have driven them to lose faith in their God. And yet this psalm begins with the simplest and most profound of biblical phrases. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Like Bile's elementary dismount, maybe this apparently elementary psalm takes on deep poignancy and meaning in context. After all those twisties, the ability to proclaim praise the Lord can't be taken for granted. There's something else we know about Psalm 111's composition, which I talked about in the children's time, and that doesn't come through in translation. This is one of several acrostic psalms. It uses the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet to structure the prayer. Scholars believe this structure was primarily designed to aid memorization. So after hallelujah, the first line begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, aleph. The second begins with bait, and so on throughout the whole alphabet. A, B, C, E, F, G. What better kind of psalm for a period of relearning the basics, retraining your heart to praise. You can remember the phrases by their alphabetization. You can practice them one by one, repeat them at home and on the road, recite them until they sink in. Practice and practice, for as the final verse reminds us, all who practice God's words, all who practice God's precepts have the beginning of wisdom and understanding. You start with A, B, C, D, and you end with a heart and mind and body that remembers God's goodness. Now, our own context, I wonder if we might speak of spiritual twisties in 2021. We haven't been forced marched to Babylon and back by any stretch, but this is a moment where we have, individually and corporately, then flipped in the air over and over again so that it's hard to remember which way is up and which way is down. We can recite the pandemic complications and the societal ills, that whole list ad nauseum, lockdown, new ways of working and schooling, constantly changing and evolving safety calculations for ourselves and our loved ones, divisions within our nation, within our families, personal challenges that can stack up when you're isolated. Which way is up and which way is down? And beyond these general societal twisties, I, in my experience, it's a year where everyone I know has dealt with very personal heartbreak or challenge as well that is made harder in isolation. And personally, and I tell you this because I think it's important to model the kind of vulnerability that I think churches and all of us need right now because we just can't pretend we have it all together anymore. I'm currently going through a probably fine but still concerning health saga related to breastfeeding. There's a 95% chance that everything is fine, but there are still moments that I'm convinced I'm seriously ill, because that's what this oriented state can do to you. And in those moments of uncertainty, my spiritual twisties are pretty powerful. Is God really good enough through all that we've been through? Is my faith really strong enough? I've been practicing this faith like the back of my hand since I was born. Shouldn't that muscle memory kick in and reassure me in times like this? And it's not just me. Over the past 18 months, so many of us have experienced loss. So many have struggled. 
So many have questioned work and calling, and much of the time we are resilient, we hold it together. But there are moments where we can get so disoriented, we think we might not survive, because that's what this state can do to you. So why, in all this, are we studying a praise psalm? Wouldn't a lament psalm be more appropriate? One with space for all the big feelings. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Why must I walk about mournfully? The psalms are full of apt phrases for times like these, and it is a good and healthy thing in our spiritual lives to embrace the words of lament psalms when we need them. Crying out to God, why, can be a faithful and powerful part of our spiritual journeys, and it puts us in solidarity with all who are oppressed and struggling. And, and sometimes we also need to simply remember and revisit how to praise. To start back with the basics again, to re-enter the sanctuary again, to rediscover delight and joy in the Lord again. And so the psalm reminds us we can start with ABC. We repeat and we practice and we begin to find our bearings again. God is great. God is good. God's works are full of majesty and honor. God provides. God is faithful. God is merciful and gracious. God endures forever. I would encourage all of you to read this psalm again after worship today. Read it aloud a few times and stop on the phrases that maybe you need to practice. Practice can be boring, but after many repetitions, it does pay off. In Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, he did some research and showed that it takes about 10,000 hours of practice, plus a good bit of fortune, to master any complex skill like chess or music composition or gymnastics. The greats have all spent at least 10,000 hours. Well, in today's world, praise may be a complex skill. It takes many hours of practice and a good bit of grace. So many of you have been practicing. Showing up to worship, whether online or at home, waking early to pray and study, praying with your hands and feet in mission, whether at home or abroad, and as the Olympics and Psalm 111 remind us, even when you put in the practice, there are times when you get flipped upside down and you have to start practicing all over again. So our challenge is each to find a way to practice. That might mean that when you look at the Psalm again later, you write one of its phrases on a little post-it note and paste it on your mirror or your laptop and you repeat it until you know it by heart again. Or it might mean you commit to a new practice of praise and community. There are new adult and youth and children's studies coming up this fall. Or it might mean you find a way to do some personal repetitions of praise. Just a few minutes throughout the day. Breath prayers have been powerful for me. A simple phrase that you can repeat over and over. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Or if you're of the musical sort, choose a praise song or hymn on your drive every morning or however you begin your day. Which reminds me, for several months around age two, my daughter latched onto this one praise song by Audrey Assad called Good to Me. So, by popular demand, I sang it to her every day, twice a day, nap time and bedtime. We played it in the car sometimes too, and the simple words 
really got in my bones with repetition and practice. I put all my hope on the truth of your promise, and I steady my heart on the ground of your goodness. You are good to me. You are good to me. You are good to me. That particular practice was an accident. I didn't set out for that practice. It was a gift to me from the smallest and most unassuming of disciples. But then, children so often show us the way. And that practice reminded me that whether you're a parent or a student or a busy employee, whatever phase you're in, we've all got some small space in our daily rhythms for practice. So as we close this time today, I'm going to ask us to try putting simple praise in practice for a moment right here and now. The songs from the Taze community in France all consist of just a simple chorus, meant to be repeated over and over as we let the meaning sink in. Uh, this one is called, In the Lord I'll Be Ever Thankful. I'm going to just sing the melody twice through so you hear how it goes with my mask on, and um, then I will ask uh, Sean to repeat it instrumentally just several more times as you can look at the words on screen and say it to yourself or just reflect on what a practice of praise might look for you um, in the coming days and weeks and season because we never get to advance to practice. 